Good morning uh, or evening if you're if you're tuning in from Asia. Uh, my name is Jennifer Turner and I direct the China Environment Forum here at the Wilson Center where I've been hanging out for 21 years. We do a lot on energy and climate issues and, and also conservation. And um, I'm really excited in the run up to China hosting the um, Convention on Biodiversity meeting in October and again in the spring, we're gonna ramp up our biodiversity meetings. And today we are starting with birds and biodiversity, kind of a, a bright spot in conservation in China. See China, it lies at the heart of the East Asian, Ulster Asian flyway which is the largest and most threatened of the world's nine migratory flyways, supporting some 50 million birds on their migratory journey. Now, China, as you all know, is, it's huge, it's got diverse habitats and, and it's, but something sometimes less known is that how biodiverse it really is. I mean, there's something like 1,300 species of birds. There's a lot more bird, there's always been a pretty strong bird watching community in China. Um, and, um, and policies are starting to increase to protect biodiversity in birds. But there have been challenges. I mean, since the 1950s in China, with the, the, as the country has grown, urbanization, that the country has lost something like 60% of, of their coastal wetlands. And that's not good news for migratory species. Um, but as noted, the tide is starting to turn. We're starting to see a lot more action in China over the past um, decade in terms of creating national parks, bird sanctuaries. A lot of um, environmental organizations are working in the space of birds. And you tuned in today because you're here to listen to this, the great speakers that I have on today's panel who are going to share stories of bird conservation successes and also outline some of the challenges and opportunities that are needed to secure uh, long-term future of China's birds. Um, now, over half of the uh, cranes in the world, species, not half the cranes, but half the species of cranes in the world are found in China. So it's no surprise that one of the very first NG US NGOs to open up their shop, I don't know, your birdhouse in China, was uh, the International Crane Foundation. And today we have um, two speakers from ICF. We've got Spike Millington and Yu Chen. And they're gonna highlight the work of the International Crane Foundation working with communities, scientists, nature reserves, and local governments to protect cranes and their habitats. Now, Spike, he's the Vice President of International Programs and Director for Asia for ICF. And he's um, previously, he was also the Chief Executive of, of the East Asian Ulster Asian Flyway Partnership, which sounds like an amazing job, Spike. You got to bring together governments, international NGOs, international organizations all about how to protect the, the, the flyway area in 22 countries. And I'm guessing China was one of your big participants. So you, you've been hanging out a lot in China over the years, haven't you, Spike? Sure, I love China, it's one of my favorite <laughs> countries. So um, yeah, so we're looking forward to your stories. So you'll kick us off. And since now, Yu Chen, now since 2018, she's been the China Program Director for International Crane Foundation based in Beijing. In the 12 years before, uh, Yuchen was in the Nature Conservancy, working a lot on biodiversity, land use issues. And I thought it was really cool, Chen Yu, that you um, provided technical support for the China, Bi China Biodiversity Conservation Strategy and Action Plan that was put in place by the State Council in 2010. And like Spike, Yuchen, she has her pulse on the biodiversity and crane protection issues in China. And then our third speaker is Terry Townsend, who is gonna talk about how Birding Beijing, together with domestic and international partners, has been raising awareness of China's wealth of bird, birds and wildlife, but also how they've been working to, in citizen science and other kinds of projects to protect some of China's rarest birds from extinction. Terry is a, as I said, he's in Beijing. He's a wildlife conservationist with a background in environmental economics and environmental law. I was really excited when I found out, Terry, that you know that you have been a fellow at the Paulson Institute. I mean, they just published that really amazing financing nature, closing the biodiversity financing gap. Next month, we're going to hopefully have Rose Neo from Paulson come talk about the China report version of financing biodiversity. Do you have your hands in that, Terry, as well? <laughs> well, as a co-author on the on the um, global one, um, the Chinese one is in Chinese only, so which limits my. Um, my written Chinese is not is not so good, so it limits my input. But there will be uh, an English language executive summary of that 
Um, awesome. And it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's going to be a really, really fantastic milestone, I think, in terms of biodiversity uh, financing in particular for China. Great. So now I also want to note that we had a really good response on the RSVPs for this meeting and um, notice there appear to be quite a few folks who are involved in birding organizations. Whether you're a birder or not, I want to encourage you to submit questions either via Twitter, so at Wilson CEF, or you email me, jennifer.turner at wilsoncenter.org. Both that, that was contact information is below the screen. And hey, if you're a birder, and if you have a picture of a bird in China or elsewhere, if you, question with bird picture gets gets more, more attention. We'll probably ask your question. So um, with that, let me just um, ask um, Spike if you could share your screen with activating the sound. And uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll get started here. Um, wanna, as he's doing that, I wanna thank the um, Environmental Change and Security Program for um, also co-sponsoring this event today. And take it away, Spike. You could unmute yourself, Spike. There you go. Yep. I'm, un I'm unmuting myself. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. I'm very, very happy to be here today. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm also very happy that um, Chian and, and Terry are here. Um, we're old friends and colleagues for a long time. I'm going to talk mostly about um, cranes um, in China. And as you mentioned, um, China is kind of the hub for cranes, um, not just in Asia, but throughout the world. There are 15 species of cranes and eight species occur in China. And most of these species are long distance migrants. And China is a really, uh, is a really important country as a crossroads for the migration of these cranes. But actually, I'm really only going to talk about two of these species. Um, and one of these is the Siberian crane. And the Siberian crane is the most critically endangered of all cranes. Um, but there are good signs of a recovery for Siberian crane. Uh, last year, we counted 5,000 birds, which is a steady increase from about 3,000 birds a couple of decades ago. Uh, it's a very wetland dependent species, and it has a long migration from its breeding areas in Siberia all the way down to the wintering area in Poyang Lake, where almost all of the population winters. And Poyang Lake is in Jiangxi province in Southeast China. But as you're all aware, the environment in China has been changing rapidly over the decades. And so the Siberian crane is navigating a very um, challenging landscape with a lot of development and a lot of um, sort of um, some loss of wetlands, some degradation of wetlands. So this is the species that I want to talk about. And what I'm gonna do is actually show a video first, and I really hope this video works, of um, Siberian cranes at Poyang Lake. And it's a picture, it's a video of, of some, a family of cranes feeding in a lotus field at Poyang Lake. And um, then, it expands a little bit to show that other species are also sharing this habitat. And it's such a beautiful species, and I really hope that, uh, that the video works okay. It's about a minute long.
So those are the those are the cranes, and every year they arrive about about a little bit later than this um, at Playing Lake, and they're very very dependent upon the um, submerged aquatic vegetation, uh, which is what they feed on, particularly the, the wild celery. And there's been a whole story about how the relationship between Siberian cranes and their food supplies in, in Poyang Lake. Oops, I'm not sure how to advance to the next slide now. Ah, there we go. Um, this is a, actually, uh, this is the migration that I was talking about. They travel over 3,000 kilometers from the breeding areas you see up there in, um, in, the, in Yakutia. And they migrate over the boreal forest, um, which is really not much suitable habitat there for them to stop until they reach the borders of Russia and China. And then they need to stop over and feed up before making their final journey down here to, to Poyang Lake. So there's a critical uh, set of wetlands here in Northeast China that really need to be managed as a set of wetlands to provide conditions that enable them to find um, these, uh, these, these plant foods that they really depend on to be able to make this journey. And so it's, it's really, uh, a very interlinked system internationally. It requires strong cooperation between between China and Russia, but also within China, it's very critical that these steps along the migratory pathway are, are really um, identified and that conservation measures um, are really put into place in, in these areas. And this is where I think China has actually done a pretty good job. Poyang Lake is a national nature reserve. There's another national nature reserve, Nanji, in the same area, plus a provincial nature reserve. And um, a lot of um, investment has gone into, um, into Poyang Lake. And similarly, for these areas in the Northeast, there are nature reserves there that also support the habitat for uh, Siberian crane. So here they are at Poyang Lake. And as I was mentioning before, they do depend on the, um, the underwater plants for feeding. But the, the ecology of the plants is, is a little bit complicated. So um, in some years, the plants do not grow very well. Other years, they do very well. And it really depends on a combination of water level and light availability to provide the tubers of the plants that the birds need. So as you know, last year, there were these record floods in the Yangtze and it caused incredible uh, human and economic damage. It was a very tragic situation. Um, and these floods meant that the, the light was unable to reach the plants in the lake. And so we had a, a total failure of the food crop of Siberian cranes. But what happened was that we were able to identify with the nature reserves and the government alternative food sources to be able to see the Siberian cranes and the other cranes that wintering at, at Poyang Lake to see through the winter. And so um, uh, lotus ponds and rice fields were, were um, set aside for um, an alternative food for Siberian cranes and all the cranes flocked to these areas because there was no natural food. So the government and the nature reserves are very active in working with, um, with, with both the local communities and with um, farms and local NGOs to, um, to actually manage this habitat, which is a very dynamic habitat so that Siberian cranes and other cranes can make it through the winter there. And similarly, this is a picture from Momoga Nature Reserve, I think. Um, the cranes really do need to um, stop on their journey. Uh, they can't make it all the way from Siberia to Poyang Lake in one go. So these are really critical sites and the birds need these shallow wetlands. And so we're working with these nature reserves to try to ensure that the, the natural ecological and hydrological conditions are suitable at the time when the cranes are there so that they're able to, um, to feed up um, 
put on their uh, reserves of, that they need to be able to, to continue their migration. And this has been, a, so far, a big success. The numbers are stable. Um, the numbers are actually increasing. And the birds uh, seem to be a, a real success story. And China is very proud of uh, Siberian cranes, and particularly Jiangxi province, where Poyang Lake is situated. This was in December 2019, before the pandemic, a huge uh, event that was put on by the, by the local authorities in Jiangxi province to celebrate migratory birds. And here you can see the, the slogan, the birds connect the world. Um, just a, a tremendous event with very high level participation from the province and a real commitment to, um, to manage um, not just Poyang Lake, but other lakes in the Yangtze Valley for migratory birds and particularly the Siberian cranes, which are called white cranes in China. And what we're doing is working with um, ICF is working with local schools to link schools along this flyway. So these are kids from uh, Wucheng Primary School um, in, in, uh, around Poyang Lake. And we're trying to link those to schools in the stopover areas in Inner Mongolia and Jili. And here is a teacher from um, Inner Mongolia province interacting with the, with the, with the kids at Wucheng. It's really, I think, important to try to work work with young people to really build a strong constituency for, for nature conservation in China. And I know Terry's going to talk about this issue um, later on too. So that's Siberian crane. And I briefly wanted to touch on another species, which is a uh, black neck crane, which breeds in the Tibetan plateau um, and winters at uh, slightly lower altitudes in China and also goes to Bhutan. And the reason I want to mention this is because it's also a bright spot. Numbers have really increased from um, really just a less than 10,000 to now over 16,000 to the extent that um, it's just been removed from the um, red list of endangered species. It went from vulnerable to, to near threatened. So this is, a, this is a real success story. Black neck cranes are doing very well. Uh, in part, this is because of more wetlands on the plateau as a result of glaciers melting. So this is clearly um, a short-term phenomenon. The, the glaciers, um, as they continue melting, are eventually going to go and the plateau is going to dry out. And then it's a very different story. So we have to be really um, well aware of what's happening with climate change and kind of be ahead of that to be able to plan conservation measures based um, you know, uh, future, future scenarios. Uh, here's the crane nesting at Rogai Nature Reserve in Sichuan province. And here they are wintering in, I think this is Huizhou in, in Yunnan province. Um, and here there is some supplemental feeding because if the food is not there, they also put out some corn and it, it attracts also the, um, the bi-headed geese too. So again, like um, Siberian cranes, one of our big efforts is try to, to link the different communities um, where, for, where, so where the um, black neck cranes nest, like uh, this is a school in, in Rogai Nature Reserve, um, with their wintering areas. So we try to bring together school teachers and school kids and sort of trace the migratory pathways of cranes as they go from the from the plateau down to these lower to the to these lower altitudes, and um, as I mentioned before, I think this is a really this this education is a really important part of of what we do. Apart from the the conservation work in trying to make sure that the habitats and the food supplies of the cranes um, are there to be able to to sustain a continued migration. So I think that's my that's my 10 minutes up, Jennifer. So I'm going to stop sharing right there. Yeah, but, but what beautiful images. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so stop sharing. And then um, I guess we will pass the uh, virtual microphone over to uh, Yu Chen. Um, and Yu Chen, you're just, go ahead. You can just start talking. We have those images of all those beautiful birds in our head, and that meditation moment with the cranes. Thank you for that, Spike. Thank you, Chen. Go ahead. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, 
between Spike and Terry, I will not show you any beautiful pictures or videos. And I will show you some boring talk, but sharing, uh, sharing with you my uh, real happy opportunity and the painful barriers uh, we are dealing with in our daily work. You have heard from Spike that um, Chinese government has um, paid much more attention to ecological conservation in recent years, um, and especially in uh, wetland protection, um, which is very exciting to us. And in early 2021, in this year, uh, the draft of CPC wetland conservation law was just uh, submitted to the standing committee of um, National People's Congress. So that means we will finally have our first uh, China wetland conservation law soon. Um, yeah, <laughs> but um, but in my opinion, for the effective conservation of for of green and other water birds, we still see um, many challenges. Um, firstly, um, compared to Compared with like forest, grassland and ocean, the study and practice on wetland conservation and management starts late in China. Um, although the government um, has, invested, uh, has invested more in nature reserves, um, but majority of them are still in lack of capacity and the resources. Many wetland, uh, many wetland managers, they have, they have difficulty in making the correct or the most uh, um, cost-effective decisions to conserve their wetlands. And some of them um, even think the, deep, the deeper the water is, the better the wetland is, but actually it's not true. And also the government funds tend to support direct, um, direct um, wetland conservation or wetland restoration engineering structure um, constructions more than the precise um, evidence-based conservation planning before the conservation that will um, affect to some extent that will affect the effectiveness of the funding use. And secondly, um, the migration flyway in eastern China overlaps with the most, most densely populated area in China. And uh, many of these areas, just like Spike show in the northeast uh, China, are dry or semi-dry area. Uh, that means the water utilization con conflict between conservation and local livelihood is very obvious. Um, so how to maintain the ecosystem, uh, how to maintain the best ecosystem functions of the nature of the wetlands for both wildlife and the human being is a big challenge for the managers, for the decision makers. And ICF as an internet as an international NGO, we started working on introducing the best um, practice of, of green habitat management from 2015. We introduced the US experience, provided the trainings and US study tours to the nature reserve staff, help them develop a zoning and adaptive management plan for more effective conservation. Uh, we made Mm, we made management plans for two national nature reserves in Northeast China. Uh, but unfortunately, the plan cannot be fully implemented with active, with active uh, water level control and vegetation manipulation as we planned. Um, because from 2016, the China government started the most restricted environmental inspection and under this in inspection, it is very difficult to, to get approval on the new land use change and the new constructions in the core zone of nature reserve. So that means we couldn't uh, build the planned dike, uh, water gate, and the culvert to control the water level and to manage the vegetation for, um, for a more dynamic uh, habitat management. Uh, then, as alternative, we have to turn to seek demonstration in wetland parks instead of nature reserve. And along with that, we strengthen our work with national and, provi uh, and uh, provincial decision makers to improve their understanding on the 
was an uh, habitat management issue. And we developed a set of technical code for the Siberian green um, population conservation and habitat management, and also develop, uh, developed a technical guidance on the scurpers that uh, what Spike mentioned, the food of Siberian green, the scurpers wetland restoration for the to keep the uh, enough food resources for the cranes. And these technical papers have been submitted to NFGA, the National Forestry and Grassland Administration, who is in charge of the, all the nature reserve management in China. And once uh, they are approved, um, they will serve as national business standard to help improve the wetland management for Siberian cranes and also benefit other cranes and, uh, and water birds. Um, I want to say something about the environmental inspection. Although it seems like hindered our, pro our pro um, project progress, but in most cases, it is a great measure. Um, the government strongly, through the in inspection, the government strongly combat the act of like omission, uh, misconduct, and, uh, and some corruption. And they improved, it improved the performance at various levels of governments and departments, and also stopped many um, illegal, depart, uh, illegal um, developments and pollutions in the nature reserve. But just as a, a coin has two sides, so this uh, one size fits all policy also caused some problems in conservation. Like in China, many nature reserves. Um, when the nature reserves, uh, the, they include they include the local communities in when they are when they were established. And many water birds, um, they live on the mosaic habitats composed of farmland and wetland. They forage in farmland and they rest in the wetlands. Um, as the required as required by the inspection, the removal of community agriculture out of the nature reserve call zone will cause the food uh, the food shortage and habitat degradation. Uh, the black necked crane living in southwestern of China is facing this problem actually. And another example is of uh, like um, bamboo in the forest. In South China, bamboo is a species that grows and spreads very quickly. Um, if without the proper management intervention, such as cutting and the shoots harvest, the bamboo, they will outcompete other um, more valuable species, for species uh, very soon in the forest. So um, after two or three years, um, of the in inspection, the removal of human activities outside the nature reserve caused on caused the heated um, debate in China. You know, China is a too big country with various um, conditions and unbalanced uh, developments. So we see a lot of uh, such one size fits all policy and we feel the pain. Uh, now, both the Ministry of the Ecological Environment and the Ministry of um, Nature, Nature Resources are trying to find solutions to, uh, to avoid the negatives, such as uh, the, uh, the NFGA, they are trying to adjust the zoning system of, of nature reserves so that um, the, some like they can keep proper, they can keep proper human activities, and uh, we have more, we can have more flexibilities in the wetland management. And generally speaking, uh, China is in the process of several reforms on environmental conservation, and I think the awareness and ability of conservation is increasing at all levels. Um, for an international NGO working in China, I think there is still um, still um, obvious needs to like to introduce the best practice from the world to China and facilitate the experience exchanges and promote the best practice through demonstration and the policy impacts. And also, I think there are still for the like for the queen and the water birds, other water birds conservation. There are still some conservation gaps beyond the government nature reserve system. So that is also what we NGOs working in China needs to care about and call for attention. 
um, that's all from my part. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was really fascinating. I have some questions, but I'm going to hold them. But remind people watching, you can email or tweet in questions. Also, when you tweet, send me some bird pictures. Um, Terry, virtual mic, over to you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks to the uh, China Environment Forum of the Wilson Center for uh, inviting me today. Um, you Chan mentioned about the growing awareness and that's something that I want to build on. So I'm gonna start by saying a bit about birds in Beijing, but then I'm gonna talk about uh, how awareness uh, is leading to uh, action uh, and inspiration. So um, I wanna say, first of all, that I, I've been in Beijing now 10 years. And so 10 years ago, when I first arrived in Beijing, um, this was the most common response when uh, but people, particularly Beijingers actually, found out I was interested in birds. They would look at me like I'm crazy and say, you know, if you like birds, why are you in Beijing? There are no birds in Beijing. And obviously for a bird watcher um, who was coming to live in Beijing, that was quite uh, disappointing news. But um, I started to explore uh, and very quickly I realized that actually uh, that was fake news. Uh, because actually more than 500 different species of bird have been recorded in Beijing, uh, which you know, is, is far more than London, Paris, Berlin, uh, Washington, for example. And in fact, during lockdown last year, I did a bit of analysis of G20 capital cities. So looking at the top 20 major economies and how many bird species have been recorded in their capital cities. And, and Beijing actually comes out at number two, which uh, I think might be surprising to a lot of people, uh, even to people that have lived here <laughs> all their lives. Um, so why is Beijing such a good place for birds? You know, and it, it's not obviously because Beijing is an environmental paradise. We all know there are problems um, with air pollution, water pollution and soil pollution, although all of those things are improving and have improved a lot over the last few years. But the main reason, just as in real estate is location, location, location. So Beijing lies on this huge flyway and Spike um, referred to it earlier, the East Asian Australasian flyway. And you can see, if you look at this map, um, to the north of Beijing, you have this vast area of Siberia, uh, you know, full of forest, very few people live there and, uh, and tundra further north. And in the summertime, this area explodes with insect life. You know, if you ever go up there in July and August, you know, you need a net, you, just for all the insects. So this is protein rich food for birds. And so it's really worth their while traveling up north to take advantage of this uh, food source, abundant food source, so they can raise more young and more quickly than if they, they uh, stayed further south. And of course in wintertime, it's you know, bitterly cold down to minus 40. So most of these birds will have to move south um, to find food and survive. And so this is like an expressway for birds. Um, and right now in September, you know, it's rush hour. So there's a real exodus happening from Siberia right now um, happening. And so birds are migrating, all different, many different species migrating. Uh, cranes and other large birds will migrate during the daytime, but most small birds uh, migrate at night. So this, most of this spectacle is happening as we sleep uh, in our beds. And in fact, we're just doing an experiment right now on the roof of um, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank in Beijing, recording uh, at night. And we're getting an insight into just how many birds are flying over and which species and so on. And, and I can tell you that in the first two weeks, we had over 1,000, uh, 1,200 uh, calls of birds flying over at night. So this is a phenomenal um, migration route. And birds don't like to travel over hostile areas like deserts and oceans. So you actually get a bit of a funnel effect uh, with the Gobi to the, to the west and the ocean not far to the, to the east that funnels a lot of these birds through Northeast China and, and, and through Beijing. Some of them are going to South China, some go to Southeast Asia, some will go all the way to Australia and New Zealand. And so Beijing, you know, just, just like us when we go on a, a long journey on this, on the expressway, you know, we need to stop, take a break, have something to eat, drink, 
uh, sleep for a bit and birds are the same. So Beijing is like a service station on this expressway uh, to continue that analogy. Um, and with the different types of, of habitat that we have in Beijing, you know, we have some wetlands, we have parks, we have a little bit of grassland, we have mountains. And so it really offers something for many, many different types of, of birds. So I would actually call it a five star service station for, for birds on this um, uh, expressway. Um, so just to give you a sense of um, some of the birds that are passing through, there's a huge variety. Uh, I won't go through these in any detail. I'll just pick out the one on the top right, the greenback flycatcher. This bird is very special. It has a tiny breeding area, it only breeds in Beijing, Hebei and Shanxi province. It's the only place in the world where it breeds. Um, so it's a real signature bird for Beijing. The one in the middle there, Oriental Plover, goes all the way to Australia for winter uh, and we can see it passing through. But I wanna focus on one particular bird, um, uh, tell you a little story about the Beijing Swift. So the Beijing Swift is a really unique bird. It's really at the vanguard of evolution. It's, it moved into the Beijing uh, in the 1400s uh, to live in the original city walls. So originally it would, it would nest in holes in caves or, uh, or even in trees. Um, they've adapted to man-made environments. So this, this bird has been associated with Beijing since the 1400s when the original city walls were built. And um, it's perfectly adapted for life in the air. So really long, thin wings for energy efficient flight, the body shaped like a torpedo uh, to go through the air very easily. Um, and an evolutionary biologist once told me that, that, that there are species that have the whole life cycle in the ocean. There are species that have the whole life cycle on the earth, but there's no species yet that has its whole life cycle in the air but the swift is the closest to it. So he anticipated that in a few hundred thousand million years or so, if evolution continues, this bird could potentially give birth to live young on the wing uh, that are able to fly uh, immediately. So it's a very, it's a very uh, special bird. It arrives in Beijing every April and uh, breeds here and then departs by the end of July. And, um, if you go to this uh, pavilion here at the Summer Palace, uh, there are about 200 swifts that live here, breed here uh, every year. And the Beijing Birdwatching Society has been monitoring this colony um, for more than 10 years. And they, every year they would go and, and catch some, they weigh them, measure them, they put little rings on their legs, metal ring with an individual number. And over several years, they're able to know that these birds are very loyal to this site. So they come back year after year. Somehow they're able to find their way back to the exact place. Um, and they knew roughly how long they live as well. Um, but what they didn't know was where these birds went when they left uh, Beijing. And so um, using some new technology, I'll just play this little video first. This is, this is um, some swifts at this pavilion, filmed at this pavilion. It's slowed down um, because they're very, very fast flyers. The calls sound quite eerie, um, so I'll just warn you, but they don't really sound like this in, in real life. So I hope you can hear that. So it's a pretty spectacular sight to see these birds around their colony, particularly early morning and early evening. Um, so, so we wanted to find out where these, where these birds go for the winter. And we use this technology uh, called geolocator, which is like, it fits like a tiny backpack onto the back of the bird. And scientists had done this in Europe and were able to connect, bring the scientists over who had, who had tracked swifts in Europe over to China um, to, to, to help with this project. And you can see it on this picture, that little tiny green square on the back uh, of the swift is, is one of these geolocators. Um, it's just been fitted and being released. And we fitted 31 of these geolocators to birds at some palace and released them. And the thing about the geolocator is that it doesn't transmit the data. So it just stores the data. The birds are very light, so they can't carry uh, anything too heavy. Uh, the guideline is 5% of body weight. And we currently don't have transmitters that are that small for SWIFT. So, so it stores the data, but it doesn't transmit it. So that means we have to wait a whole year um, to go back to the site and recatch the same birds, uh, take off the geolocator to be able to find out uh, where, they, where they go. 
mean, if you bear in mind these birds, they eat flying insects. You know, they spend nearly all their life in the air, so they only really land to lay their eggs um, and to feed their feed their young. Uh, so we know they eat flying insects, and so we think, okay, there's not many flying insects in Beijing. So where is it going to go uh, for the winter? And, and obviously, you know, there are some good candidate places. Some people thought India, you know, it's pretty warm in winter. There's quite a lot of insects. Some people thought maybe Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, the rainforest, there's plenty of insects. Uh, it's warm. Some people thought maybe Australia because swifts are seen in, in, there are swift species in Australia in winter. So um, we had a whole year to think about it. And, uh, and then we went back to the Summer Palace and we managed in one hour, we managed to catch 13 of the original 31 species that were uh, 31 birds that were fitted with geolocators and um, we took the first one that had the geolocator you know we took it off connected up to the computer and everyone was like huddled around the, the laptop waiting for this map appear to appear that was going to show us for the first time where the swift uh, Beijing swift goes for the winter and this is what we found so actually it doesn't go to India or Malaysia or Australia it goes all the way to southern Africa uh, for the winter and in fact sort of has Christmas in Cape Town which I'm quite jealous of um, so in, in in winter they're quite nomadic they'll follow the emergence of termites um, so they tend to wander around quite a lot around Namibia and South Africa and the Cape there um, but you can see this incredible journey so from Beijing they actually head northwest uh, into Mongolia and then they pretty much follow the Silk Road uh, and then they go that south uh, north of the Himalayas then south through Iran Arabia and into Africa and, and then they end up down in um, Namibia and South Africa and they take a pretty similar route on the way back and the really amazing thing is that we're pretty confident we're 99% certain that these birds will do this migration from Beijing to South Africa and back without landing at all so that's been proven among uh, European swift it's not yet proven among swifts from Beijing but we're pretty confident that they'll be the, that it'll be the same so really, really incredible journey. Something like um, 16 countries they pass through, no passports, no visas, no um, health checks, no vaccines, uh, you know, just free as a bird. So this, this animation actually, each colored dot here is one of the 13 birds that we recovered in that first hour. Um, you can see the date going along the bottom real time so there's already by late august early september they're already in africa so they, they leave and we, we get fuzzy data around the equinox because the day length is the same as the night length and that's why they disappear there but then in october you can see them by late october november they're already down in southern africa and uh, they, they hang around there pretty much until late february and you'll see this sort of this is christmas around the cape and they wander uh, looking for termite emergencies. So that's their main source of food in winter. And you see February, they're already starting to move up into Central Africa. And um, we lose them again at the equinox, spring equinox um, because of the fuzzy data. And then just look at how quick they come back to Beijing in spring. Incredibly fast, except for those two who are probably students or something <laughs> getting up late. Um, and just a comparison, so the, the red and orange here show the tracks from Beijing and the purple and blue show tracks from Cambridge in, in England. So you, just to compare the two, and you can see that the Cambridge Swifts winter in the green area in Mozambique and in Southeast Africa, and the Beijing Swifts winter in the black area that, that, that we talked about just now, South Africa and, and Namibia. And what's interesting is that in Central Africa, they actually mix. Um, so they actually come into contact with each other um, but so far we have no evidence of a of a Chinese swift getting a British girlfriend and bringing her back to Beijing or or vice versa they all seem to go back to where they were born at least that's what we find so far so this team that did this project what was interesting was that there were only really a couple of professional scientists everyone else was a volunteer so there were taxi drivers there were teachers students um, shopkeepers you name it um, so it was a really, really fun project that really captured the imagination of a lot of people. And of course, it's a great story. So it got a lot of media coverage, you know, Swift's linking 
Beijing with Africa, you know, almost following the one belt, one road route. You know, there are so many angles to this uh, to this great story and, and it got a lot of coverage domestically and also overseas. And then uh, one of the things that I do a lot is visit schools, talk about biodiversity, and we, we inevitably talk about the swift. And um, one of the things we talk about is how the population of the swift has gone down in, in recent decades, because Beijing has lost a lot of the old traditional buildings where the swifts uh, nest. They have these little nooks and crannies high up for them to nest. And uh, of course, the new buildings are all straight lines, shiny, uh, no, no place for the swift. So uh, we've lost uh, quite a few over the last few decades. Anecdotally, we don't really have much um, data uh, that, that will show this definitively, but certainly anecdotal evidence tells us that we've lost a lot. And they're good for us to have around in the city because they eat thousands of insects each every day. So they're like a sort of natural insecticide. So we want to encourage um, having Be Beijing swifts in the capital. And so schools often they say, well, what can we do to help? We say, yeah, of course, you know, you can help. You can make and uh, put up special swift boxes on your schools, on your campus. And so now there are something like seven or eight schools across Beijing uh, making and putting up nest boxes on their school campuses. And we heard from the International School of Beijing um, that they've been successful in attracting Swifts uh, for the last two years now, which is wonderful, wonderful news. And then one girl, um, she put up her hand and said, OK, this is really easy. We can make boxes. But why don't we write to the bosses of the building companies and ask them to make their new buildings friendly for Swifts? So what a brilliant idea. Um, and so four schools got together and nominated a SWIFT ambassador each. And they each of them uh, wrote, they, well, together they wrote a letter to the boss of probably the most famous building company in China, Soho China, uh, Pan Shi and Zhang Xin. And um, uh, they received a reply. And Mr. Pan said, please come and see me. You know, I, I didn't know about this bird. So set up a little workshop um, and each of the four SWIFT ambassadors from the different schools each presented to Mr. Pan something about the SWIFT. So the first one talked about the amazing lifestyle in the air, how it eats in the air and drinks in the air, sleeps in the air even. Second one talked about the incredible migration to Africa and back. The third one talked about how the population has gone down uh, because of the loss of the old buildings. And the fourth one talked about what schools are doing to help and so they, then they collectively asked Mr. Pan, can you please help as well? And so Mr. Pan stood up and he said, yes, of course. He said, I didn't know about this bird before you came and told me. And he said, we've been making buildings for 20 years to make people's lives better. And he said, I realize now we should be making buildings not only to make people's lives better, but also for wildlife. So he made three commitments. One was to make and put up 200 uh, special SWIFT boxes on existing buildings in Beijing. Second was to integrate into the design of new buildings, um, the right size holes for SWIFTs. And the third commitment was to promote biodiversity among the building sector in China. And some of you might know that Mr. Pan is actually a, a carpenter in his uh, spare time. So he, he loves to make things out of wood. So he actually made these nest boxes here and he's presenting them to the swift ambassadors here signing them um, and he has something he's a bit of a rock star in china so he has millions of followers on social media so they all wanted their uh, selfie with him for their wechat moments um, which obviously he was obliged to do but some the eagle-eyed among amongst you will note that perhaps he's not as good a carpenter as he thinks uh, you might notice that one of his fingers uh, has a bandage on it if you look at the bottom left um, so, so he certainly uh, put himself through the pain barrier to, to, to do this project. But um, so I wanted to tell this story because I think what it shows is a you know, that nature is full of incredible stories that can inspire people. You know, and this this is a story that's recently been discovered through modern technology, tracking technology, but the incredible journey of this bird that's so um, linked with with Beijing. And, you know, this is just one story. There are lots and lots of stories out there still to be discovered. And I think, you know, nature, when we, when we discover these secrets, these, they inspire people. 
uh, into action you know and a lot of people say to me a lot of young people say oh what can I do you know what I'm just one person what can I do to help biodiversity and so I tell them this story you know because if if four students can get together and make this happen you know then I think it really shows the potential uh, and that everyone uh, can make a difference so so I think I'll stop there I'll probably use my time um, and just to sort of hopefully that encapsulates some of what's happening in China in terms of this awareness, growing awareness and how people are taking action, caring about their biodiversity and really making a difference. So thank you very much. Good thing I was muted. I was laughing loudly a few times here. <laughs> <laughs> and then ironically, a woodpecker started pounding on my house too. That was yet another reason to have the mute on when you're not presenting. Um, no, this is fabulous. I've got lots of, some questions are trying to come in, reminding people watching, tweet us at Wilson CEF or email me. The address is underneath the, the, the webinar here. But I want to ask a question, just kind of following up on your last slide, but I think it's for everyone. Do you have this Soho businessman? Um, are there other examples of, of for all, all three of you, where businesses have gotten involved in some of the, the bird or the crane conservation? I mean, ICF has been there a long time. You told us a little bit about your work with governments, so, but um, I'll let whoever wants to jump in. Any business uh, contributions? I mean, seeing that development is is the major threat to a lot of the habitats. I, I can quickly uh, I can give a quick answer, and then perhaps um, Spike and, and Chen can also say something. But certainly, business is getting a lot more active. I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that a lot of them are floating on the stock market. They're now becoming um, uh, they're seeing shareholder pressure to do things on the environment. I think there's also um, government uh, you know is in line with government policy so china hosting cbd obviously is a big uh milestone and i think companies want to show that they're in line with uh the objectives of the outcome that's we all hope will will come out of kuming and so i think yeah and, and a lot of them having foundations you know a lot of the big successful entrepreneurs now you know alibaba and and Soho and others, you know, it, it have foundations to do you know, charitable um, uh, projects. And, and of course, most of those are, are in China and quite a few are focused on the environment. So there's a lot happening there also. So I think, again, you know, it's, it's an area that I think has really, really uh, expanded over the last 10 years, quite a lot. And I think there's still a lot more potential for, for more. Spike or Chen, anything on the business question? Sure, I think I think Chen can probably answer this more because she works quite a lot with private sector in China. But but for instance, for Siberian cranes, one of our biggest supporters is the Disney Corporation through the Disney Conservation Fund, and so um, we work quite closely with the Disney Shanghai, which is a you know a huge resort in, in in Shanghai, and they have an, an Earth Month every year where they try to highlight biodiversity issues. And so we're working with, um, with Disney Shanghai to link up their programs, their awareness programs um, with the Afield programs in Poyang Lake. And, and they, have a small, they have a small lake actually at the, at the resort, mm -hmm. which they're sort of trying to, I don't know if twinning's the right word, but, but, <laughs> but you know, it's kind of a little sister, big sister with, with Poyang Lake. And so, you know, I think that we're seeing actually a lot more involvement with, with the private sector in China, a lot more interest and a lot more awareness too. And, um, you know, Jan could probably talk more about it because she deals with this on, on a daily basis. Actually, Chen, before you talk, you Chen, you had made a comment about how, um, that you're seeing a lot of like water wetland engineering projects. And it made me think of the, um, cause I'm gonna have a meeting on this next month about the sponge city initiatives in China where they're very concerned because a lot as you guys I mean happens here in the US as well all the cement in our cities they flood as climate change impacts get greater um, and so there are these there's these amazing architectural wonders that are being built around cities but and that's a, that's a business as well you know I mean it's working with the companies what about uh, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that on you know finding the balance between the the engineering you know you know built wetlands, um, you know, hit, missing the mark or hitting the mark? Okay, I, I would firstly like to follow the question about the, how the corporates, um, I think I can 
mentioned, especially the Chinese corporates, they are work, how they are working on the um, environmental conservation and the bird conservation. As I remember, when I started joining the NGO in 2000, um, 2006, there were very few um, um, companies, Chinese companies, make a donation to the conservation. And uh, in 2000, in 2004, China has uh, at least uh, a policy to encourage the to encourage a pro, um, private foundation establishment. So, like the individuals or the uh, companies and some of the other the groups, you can set up the private com uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, foundations, and. Uh, and also the, they, they start from the very easier charity as the children or the house or planting trees. But then um, in recent, like I think in, in this recent decade, we can see that more and more Chinese companies, they, they start to do more, um, more advanced uh, conservation, either like climate change or the wetland and the birds, not just the, planting simple planting trees. So I think that's really a, a, a improvement. Yeah. And uh, just like uh, you mentioned about the, the, the constructions, I think uh, what I mean in the China, the, the, the companies, um, they in the wetland restoration, they get the fund, the nature reserve, they get the fund from the government and they will like build some of the infra infrastructures for uh, either for the monitoring or for the, or for the, the such uh, um, shelters, that such thing. I think the sponge, sponge city may be a different topic. You know, the sponge city were very, a hot topic in China and where China introduced many um, experience in Europe and the US, but there was something like um, in the, even in the construction, I think it's a systematic thing, not just on the surface or the roof floor, but also the underground system. That's a, another very complex um, uh, issue. Okay, I'll have to, well, definitely when I do my sponge city meeting, I'll have to in, invite a conservation expert like you to come also comment. Um, all right, I've gotten a couple of questions coming in and two of them are kind of similar. One from Ted Ling who asks, does the Chinese government engage in environmental diplomacy with other countries along the flyways to cooperate internationally in conservation? And uh, another um, email said that similar, the US has signed various international treaties on migratory bird conservation, does China, have any official international agreements to conserve? Yeah, so what, what, what's going on um, internationally? I'm guessing maybe Spike starts us off because this was your playground or your fly ground for many years. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. It's a really good question. And it's a really important question too, because you know it's um, when you talked uh, at the beginning about these 50 million migratory water birds that migrate up and down the flyway um, among 22 countries. I mean, there's truly a shared natural heritage among those countries. And it's always been a little bit of beef of mine that when, when there are diplomatic talks, this shared biodiversity, all of these birds that depend on these countries is not really brought up as an issue. It's all about the trade and economy. But we're seeing a change in actually in that, in that situation. And part of that is because um, there's a much greater awareness now, I think, um, along all countries of the flyway about the need for international cooperation. And there has been very active cooperation. And so um, birds that are migrating from Australia and New Zealand all the way to, to um, Arctic Russia and Alaska and that depend on China, they depend on the mudflats of the Yellow Sea for refueling, um, has really forced um, not just conservationists, but I think a broader now community to actually address this issue. And, and we're seeing at ambassador level, we're seeing it being brought up. And I think um, Terry mentioned that this week, um, both Jan and Terry are going to visit uh, with the New Zealand ambassador specifically on, bio, on a shared biodiversity related issue. So the whole um, East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, which, which brings those countries together, is actually predicated on really um, looking at an international solution to really what is what is what is fundamentally a shared biodiversity issue. 
Anyone else want to make a comment on that question or did, did Spike nail it? He nailed it. All right. Well, what about the, we have the, let's talk international. I mean, we've got the China's hosting the convention on biodiversity. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts on that. Um, do you, any kind of changes or some kind of initiative do you think that's coming up? I mean, that China's doing, to, I mean, I've seen acceleration on, you know, the national park system. I mean, it got opening, got delayed because of COVID, but there seems to be a lot of changing in terms of like the, the protected areas. And uh, Chen mentioned the wetland law. Anything else you want to note about what are you, I don't know, what are you seeing coming out of it that could be good for your birds, your flyways? Crystal ball time. <laughs> Terry, you have a crystal ball. I think, well, yeah, I think, um, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, China is doing a lot. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you mentioned the, the strengthening of laws and the creation of new laws on Yangtze River and um, things like that. The updating of the wildlife protected, protected list um, of, of specially protected species, you know, which hadn't been updated for, for decades. So that was long overdue, but that's really welcome. National parks, you mentioned um, government officials are now assessed on you know, environmental criteria as well as GDP delivery. So th there's quite a lot of positive developments happening in, in the run up to China hosting COP. I mean, as to what's going to come out of COP15, you know, we, we know that there's going to be a new agreement looking ahead uh, with a number of targets. Um, you know, and we also know that the previous 10 years, the Aichi targets, you know, none of them were achieved. And I think uh, uh, so targets for bird habitat well, for biodiversity, I mean, for oh, biodiversity, biodiversity. Okay. yeah, yeah as, as a whole. So there are a number of targets uh, that were set um, the Aichi targets 10 years ago, none of which were achieved. So there has to be a serious look at why they weren't achieved. And, you know, before you, you have a new agreement, you don't want to just repeat the same old mistakes. Um, you know, and I think there are two reasons why, uh, why uh, they weren't achieved. One is that biodiversity just hasn't had the political um, priority that it deserves. Um, and the second one is a lack of financing. And, uh, and I think, you know, the first aspect of that is beginning to happen. There's beginning to be a bit more political priority on biodiversity, and this is long overdue. I mean, if you look at the risks of biodiversity loss, which are very poorly understood, but what we do know is that they are very, very serious and they you know, can be, really be split into two main risks. One is economic risks. You know, we know that things like the loss of pollinators would cost the global economy more than $200 billion a year. And that's just one tiny, tiny ecosystem service. Um, we know also that uh, biodiversity loss puts people into contact with stressed ecosystems in a way that increases the risk of zoonotic diseases. And we all know how devastating they can be. You know, a study last year from the World Economic Forum showed that at least half of the global economy, $44 trillion, is heavily or moderately dependent on nature or the services it provides. So we're starting to understand more now our reliance on nature and the risks of, of that biodiversity loss. And that is beginning to elevate the issue uh, politically. And that's absolutely fundamental. We can't afford this to be just an issue for biodiversity and environment ministers. It has to be like climate change eventually moved from environment ministers into economic finance planning ministries and biodiversity has to do the same um, but we don't have that time that it took for climate change to to make that journey we have to to accelerate that uh, much quicker and then the financing aspect is another huge issue and uh, you know we could have a separate webinar on that alone um, but I'm that, going that's to. fundamental <laughs> as well yeah <laughs> very good yeah yeah so I'll no, stop no, there <laughs> no no this, this is super informative well kind of let's drill, drill down I want to shift back to, to one of the like the Spike or Chen, can you guys talk a little bit about the, um, like there's the Yangtze River protection law. There's a lot of action on protecting the coasts. I mean, is there anything else that you want to detail about, you know, the kind of progress? Because obviously the Chinese are going to have to finance it, incentivize it. Anything you want to tell us about that? Um, you know, for the, um... Yeah, the, I talked about the, the Yangtze River because that's where a lot of the cranes, and not just cranes, but a lot of migratory water birds spend the winter. And, um, you know, 
the, has been a new uh, Yangtze River law that's just been declared. And it's very good because it's based on the ecological and hydrological integrity of the, of the river. It really is very well-meaning. It talks about addressing the issues from all the way from the source to where the Yangtze enters into the sea and looking at it as an ecological system. It's a very different way of looking at it from the traditional engineering, engineering way. So um, that's very encouraging, but it, it's a little bit the issue that um, Chan brought up before about one size fits all. So one of the things that they've decided that's important to do is to have a fishing ban. So they put in a fishing ban for the Yangtze River. Well, it's very well-meaning and I think it's very good, but it's not really the critical issue about the, um, for instance, a wetland degradation. The real issue is related, for instance, to Huang Lake to, to sand mining. So constant sand mining has, has altered the water level, has altered the hydrology, has altered the environment for the plants that the drains depend on, for instance. So that's, you know, that's um, a real problem. Yeah, I mean, and but it's a big business. And no, I've, I've actually been kind of concerned about the, the ban as well. Just, I mean, what that means for the people that were, you know, fishing on the river. And these, a lot of these were kind of more small artis artisanal fishers. Um, Chen, did you well, want to add anything I, on that? Can I just or, address sure, that please. point now, because you brought it up. So we actually worked a lot in historically with fishermen to make sure that water levels are adjusted for, for both you know, fishing returns and for the water level for, for the cranes. And um, so now when fishing ban, there's no incentive for fishermen to actually cooperate on that. So you're really, that, that potential for cooperation to actually manage wetland between the fishermen and conservationists has, has been lost a little bit. And as part of the fishing ban also, there are, there are many um, crab and crayfish ponds, which are also now banned. And so what we're seeing in this explosion in these non-native crayfish populations in around Poyang Lake, and they're eating up the vegetation. So this is the same vegetation grains depend on. So this is a real sort of ecological um, crisis that's, that's happening in terms of the, the actual ecology of the lake. And it's all coming from a well, a well intended policy, but the, the, the nuances of that policy are not really able to be addressed, it seems, at the moment. It's the same as the wetland issue that Chian talked about. You know, we want to do, um, we want to put some small infrastructure developments in nature reserves to better control water levels, but there's a blanket ban on infrastructure in, in, uh, in nature reserves. So I think that's the challenge now for China is to get from the broad policy and legislative agenda to how do we actually build in enough flexibility to address some of the issues that are going to be coming out of those policies. Thank you. Um, I got a question from Christina Larson. Hi, Christina out there. Um, uh, she works for the AP. She asks, um, is controlling pesticide use a significant issue for protecting birds in China? And maybe have we seen some measures to address it, if it is? Terry? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's a huge issue. I mean, you know, we see it obviously in Western Europe and, and in other places where heavy pesticide use has caused serious decline. Well, it's probably the cause of, of serious declines in a lot of particularly large insect eating birds, you know, things like shrikes and, and, uh, and so on. Um, you know, in China, certainly in, in Beijing, I don't see that. Uh, to the same extent, um, you know, a lot of the agriculture around here is is fairly small scale, and you know, it's not sort of blanketly um, blanket carpeted with uh, with pesticides on a regular basis. Um, yeah, but that said, there there are issues. I mean, certainly the the crested ibis, for example, one of the the success stories you could say mm -hmm. in, in China's conservation history. Um, you know, which was thought to be extinct and uh, in China and uh, was rediscovered, I think only seven individuals. Um, and uh, the one of the reasons for that decline in population around that area or in the rice paddies where it was feeding was was use of chemicals. And so the government immediately banned the use of chemicals from the local people. It, uh, 
growing rice in that area, you know, which, uh, and, and there are other measures as well that went into place, but obviously that resulted in a um, increase in, in the population. And now it's, you know, up to, up to quite healthy levels. And now we're at the stage where the local people can benefit from that because they are um, able to market their rice, at a, sell their rice at a premium because it's no chem there's no chemicals, you know, it's effectively organic rice. And so they, um, they can actually benefit from that. Um, so that's one, one small example where chemical use has been restricted and it's benefited the birds and it's also benefited the people. Um, but in terms of nationwide, I'm, I'm not so familiar with the policy on, in this area. So I don't know if, if Chen mm -hmm. maybe knows more. Chen, did you want to add anything? Um, actually, I, 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 I didn't. I, at first, I want to share one uh, observation from um, this spring. This spring, we see, uh, you know, this year, the Siberian crane, they forage a lot in the farmland in Northeast China. And that's uh, the farmers mainly they plant the corns, and and our staff and and the volunteers keep watching in that area. And because over two thousand of Siberian cranes are there, and uh, there are the there are the uh, treated corn seeds, uh, kind of purple, the color is purple, and they are in the and and we realize we found that the. The, the Siberian cranes they didn't eat the the colorful the, the treated um, corns. We we don't know why, and uh, it uh, we we keep watching for for a while, and uh, didn't find that. We, we don't know whether they how they pick something, how they distinguish by the by what kind of things. But that's 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 a phenomenon we we see this year, and uh, um. Yeah, I think that's what I can share. <laughs> okay, we just have a couple more minutes left, and I don't know if maybe give you each a. Uh, we did, yeah. We could, oh, I could talk so much longer with you guys. So much fun. One thing that came out that there was a lot of conversations about community and NGO kind of projects and and work that's going on. Maybe that's I, any topic. But if if you want to make a final comment about anything about maybe any group or someone you're working with in the NGO community on the birding protection, um, Spike, you want to start out or. I think actually I'll leave the mm -hmm. I'll leave the community part to to Jen, Jen? because okay. she's actually on the ground working working with communities. But you know, if I wanted actually some kind of closing closing comment, I wanted to actually go back to the CBD meetings, and I mm -hmm. think that um, you know now there's a recognition that we're going to have to deal with climate change and biodiversity and, and ecosystems all together. They're all part. They have to be connected in the solution. And China, of course, was very active in the Paris Agreement in terms of, um, you know, setting up the, the procedures, the targets, compliance mechanisms. And my concern is that, you know, we really need to do the same for biodiversity and, and, and COP, the, the COP15 uh, in, in, in Kuming is a really good opportunity to do this. But and Terry mentioned that, you know, the targets were missed last mm -hmm. time around. So it's not a question of having more targets. I think it's a question of having really binding targets, having compliance mechanisms, having implementation mechanisms to make sure that you know, people, countries are held to account on, on biodiversity. I think without that, it's gonna be very difficult to achieve the kind of change that we need over the time scale that we need it. And um, you know, China has taken, has taken a lead on climate change, but. Um, I'm really hoping that they're able to, to step up also um, and, and do the same for biodiversity. Not to maybe change someone's final comment, but I got a question from Eduardo Gallo, um, who, who wrote, what is the role of third party certification schemes for biodiversity conservation in China? So maybe in terms of making sure things are done the way they're supposed to. Anyone, Terry, you just gave a little wry smile. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, watch that smile. <laughs> what? Um, well, I, I guess it, I mean there's a, there's a lot to talk about on on the. I mean, I think the whole issue of assessments, environmental impact assessments, and you know third party assessments. There's a huge area to go into there. Um, so that's the, I bring you three back to talk on that. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a lot to be said. So Ed, we'll get back to a lot that. To be said. It's a huge topic. And I think next month, maybe with the meeting on Rose with the finance, we might be able to get into it. Um, did Chen and Terry, do you each have a quick short statement to close yourself, close it out for us today? Chen, um, Chen go first. Okay. Thank you. I think, um, I think the, the queen and the birds conservation is really, I feel it is more, I, my personal, I feel it's more challenging than protected the mammals because they they fly so long, such long distance and we cannot control them to stay in the nature reserve or stay in the, the neighborhood of the yard of the farmers. So I think the protection of the birds really needs the whole society, the local community, the local NGOs, the international NGOs, the governments, and the, also the scientific research institutes to work together. And as an international NGO, I think um, we have so limited staff and resources. So um, I think our niche is to figure out, to find some, the, to figure out the, uh, the situation or the priority or the, some of the gaps and of some of the things that the government or the other partners may ignore, just like the the, the fishing ban thing, we may we may see some alarm at the warning issue, and then I think we should work really um, uh, generate the synergies with all the stakeholders to realize on that and to, to have the joint efforts to protect the cranes. And also I think as international NGO and one of, and as the China is important role in the flyway, I think as F, we are also playing a role like a bridge to set up all the connections among the area in breeding and stopover and, and wintering area because all the parties need to work together without each party, this it would, we will not get the success. It's your own ecosystem to help protect the broader ecosystem. Fabulous. Terry? Um, yeah, very quickly. I, I'd build on Spike's point, by the way, about bringing together biodiversity and climate change. I think COP15, COP26, really, really important. And I think there's really two really, really important reasons why we have to bring them together. If we, if we look from a biodiversity focus, um, Climate change, one of the biggest things we need to do is clean energy infrastructure. Clean energy infrastructure has a land footprint that's up to 12 times uh, the traditional energy infrastructure. There's a recent study in North America showed that clean energy infrastructure is the biggest threat to biodiversity in North America. Uh, if you look at all the carbon neutral uh, targets that have been set, you know, net zero by 2050, inevitably that's gonna involve a lot of offsetting. Uh, what's one of the most popular ways for offsetting? Tree planting. If tree planting isn't done right, it can also be a big threat to biodiversity. If you plant trees on grasslands or wetlands, you know, which has been done in places. So we really need to make sure that we do, that we tackle climate change in a way that's consistent with biodiversity and that doesn't undermine biodiversity because both of these uh, international environmental crises present tremendous risks. And if we just focus on the climate side, uh, we may, through all good intentions, actually be making ourselves worse off by increasing the risks of biodiversity loss. So that's one point. The second point I just wanted to say really is that, um, you know, the key for, for biodiversity really is getting more people aware um, that there's a very famous quote, you know, everyone, in the end, everyone wants to protect what they love, uh, but they can only love what they know. And so I think, you know, knowing about your biodiversity that they have around them falling in love with it just like those students did with the swifts you know it shows what can be done and i think this is this is the key is is connecting more people to nature helping them to fall in love with nature and i think if we can do that then we'll build more support for policies that will protect and restore our biodiversity so that's what i hope we can do in the future Thank you so much. I mean, you, I mean, and also, I mean, ICF and Burning Beijing and all of your, your own ecosystems that you're building are, are, are working on that great mission. And I want to thank you, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank you for coming to talk today 
I'm definitely having you guys back. Maybe I'll step you into different different flops for different panels um, to interject your, your wisdom on biodiversity. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I um, want to let the people watching know that um, end of the month on the 29th, we're having a meeting about plastic packaging. And down the pike, in a few months, I'm going to have someone talking about the impacts of plastics on migrating birds. So, you know, it's all, it's all coming together, plastic climate and biodiversity for me. Thank you so much. And I want to thank my AV team for getting, making this happen for us today. And um, we will see you soon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Thank you.